How y'all doing? I, I'm a, I go around certain websites like Channel Awesome and all those and some movie um, critics on, on, the, on the internet. And there's this, been, this common um, saying um, of a lot of these critics that don't really care too much for the use of CG, computer graphics, and like the old practical method of special effects at the time. Some of them will even go as far as saying that we have too much CG, it doesn't look right, we should go back to the practical ways before. Can we, is that going to be an absolute, should we be that divided when it comes to when you watch a movie or something that you have to have one special effect because you're just jaded of the other means? Let's explore certain things in, uh, as far as special effects from old school on back. Before CG, and you wanted to do a fantastic monster, you had so you have a few, few options. One, there's costumes, and um, and a great example of that is Godzilla. But the problem with the costumes is that you can always tell that it's a guy in a suit. And if you take a look at the old 50 science fiction movies of aliens, a lot of them are not the best in the world. So what else was there? Well, there's um, puppets, and again. That could be even less convincing a majority of the time, but many of the classic Star Wars trilogy shows um, puppets that we were pretty convinced, even though we still know there were puppets, that um, we could see that you know that they could be put to very good use. Or one of my favorite examples is David Lynch's Dune. In this, you have um, in the movie you have these gigantic sandworms going across a desert planet, and what made it work was the fact that. Um, they did it in such a way that it did look massive, and it did look very, you know, it got a good slow going, it very, and integrated very well. If you look at the special effects, you can see that these kind of little jerky hand things, you couldn't possibly think that they would be convincing, but they made it work. So it's not impossible. And, and probably the most convincing of, of the old fashioned special effects would have to be um, stop motion. Um, that's because um, it, it, it has many advantages. For instance, you could shape the monster however you like, as thin as you want. You know, have it you know have it all sorts of proportions, and it could work very well. However, what for modern viewers, the only thing they have a problem watching this is that it has that sort of jerky look about that. And let's see, well, good old classic King Kong. Again, does you know, all the special effects and monsters were done by stop motion, but it adds great character towards it. But then again, this was also remade a few years ago with Peter Jackson, a huge King Kong fan himself. And I, and I do consider both of these. It's very good to watch both the classic and the new one. And here you got these, you know, and you got this one has been much beloved by them, by, um, by movie critics and, and film buffs. And yet, yeah, this one, well, you may like it, but you don't hear it as much as iconic as the original. Why is that? It may be another question one other time. Let me bring it up here. But let's see. So then we got uh, Jurassic Park, which sort of really set the standard um, in the same way Jurassic Park sort of set it. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Well, King Kong set the standard back in the 30s. It, you know, it's funny about stop motion. When it first came out, before King Kong, there was a silent movie of um, The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he was able, and I think Sir Arthur, I think it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself, used the footage of the stop motion animals to professionals at the time, and I think scientists, and he, he was able to convince them that this was wildlife footage. That was how convinced they were that this was. Um, uh, how convinced they were of the special effects, even though we could look at it as like, so obviously, you know, it's just too jerky, it's not very fluid or anything, but I'll get to, I'll get to that in a moment here when it comes to convincement from the audience. So, let's see, uh, now let's see, now we got, so we got CG, and there were some computer graphics before Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, Young Sherlock Holmes were, and maybe a few other examples were, um, computer graphics were used to do some very um, interesting special effects, and Terminator 2 was, you know, with the T-1000, really impressed a lot of people. I was more interested in T-800, but that's that's just me. But here we got um, computer graphics come in, and particularly with Jurassic Park, and it blew everybody away. We were seeing dinosaurs in probably the most realistic we've ever seen on film, 
Um, in comparison to the old methods we've seen from stop motion in particular, or guys in suits in some of those weird movies, ugh, that's very, um, they can be quite bad to look at. But nowadays you have a lot of people saying, hey, CG's being used too much, it's not really doing it for me. I mean, I, I like these old movies where it's the practical special effects, that's much more convincing. So why is that? Well, I think with computer graphics, we have the tools to, to, when you use them and do it well, it's a wonderful thing to watch. But that could be true with just about anything. And for instance, Jurassic Park, um, can we go back, for example, and this involves a guy who did another movie, I'll introduce you all here, uh, Dragon Slayer. This is a simple movie here, brought about, it was brought out by Paramount, but it was backed by Disney, so technically it could be sort of a Disney film. came out in the 80s about a young magician whose master was killed, and his master was hired to kill his dragons, causing a problem across this kingdom. And, well, his master dies by the villain of the film, and so now he's going to take his place as a princess, princess wizard who doesn't really know much of anything, he's going to try and slay the dragon. And then throughout the movie, you kind of get hints of the dragon with some puppetry, but also it has um, some good stop motion in that. So I want to bring this up because the guy who did the stop motion at this time was a guy named Phil Tippett. And he's taken his cues off Ray Harryhausen, also another classic Ray Harryhausen of the great um, Sinbad trilogy. You know, Golden Voyage of Sinbad, Sinbad the Eye of Tiger, and the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And the Clash of Titans, I'll bring that up in a minute. But, as I said, usually what you have a problem with stop motion in the old methods is that you have the um, you have that sort of jerky movement because, you know, stop motion, you take a model, a very bendable model, and you have to do it frame by frame, move it a bit, take a picture, move it a little bit, take a picture. So you have that sense of life, but it doesn't have that sort of fluidity about it. Now, Phil Tippett came up with a method called Go Motion, which sort of fixed that. Um, to where it looked even better. It has a sort of, when it moved, it had a good motion blur about it. You can see it very well in the dragon movements of this. So, then we got um, 93 comes about, and Phil Tippett was hired to go uh, to help with the special effects Jurassic Park. And he had, and you can probably look at the Jurassic Park DVD, um, like this one right here. And it will it has a behind the scenes feature, and it tells about his little um, preview special effects, you know, sort of test footage of the stop motion. And one of the problems is that Steven Spielberg was just it, it just looked too um, jerky and moment. You know, all the problems that stop motion had. Then they found out with computers that they can do it fluently, they can do it very convincingly, and Steven Spielberg. Um, was going with that. Well, this worried Phil Tippett for a while because now he's, you know, the very skills that he has is pretty much going to be out of date. But he did have a skill that the computer guys did not have. And that involved his understanding of the knowledge of, um, of how animals move. The CGI guys can take something, uh, um, put it in a computer, flesh it out, and if it stands it looks great. But if you don't know how the animal is moving, you're, you're going to find out very quickly when you see it, and nobody's going to be convinced about it. Phil Tippett understood. So he adapted himself to the technology and trained them um, how, and brought them to, to zoos and you know, um, motion classes so you can find out. See, there's that uncanny valley of things that it, the less real something is, you will start finding more human characteristics about it, but the closer it gets to something more real, or at least what you convince is real, you start noticing things that wouldn't work. And so if you, you can have computer-generated dinosaurs or not, if they're not very, um, if they're not moving the way you uh, expect an animal to move at those proportions, then you're not going to be as convinced, but can you still be fooled? Sure. If something, if you have no real basis of comparison um, with how something is, you can be convinced that by a way exaggeration of movement. From, let me give you this sort of um, thought experiment right here. I want you to imagine today's world without elephants or anything of large size like that. 
um, no rhinos, no hippos, nothing like that. And so, with but particularly elephants. The largest thing we probably have is a horse. And not that they didn't exist, but you know we have pretend that they're extinct, but there's all fossils, so we can only imagine what they look like. And we can take those animals and re, you know, have scientists recreate them and have them in their thoughts. And let's just pretend that these animals are fascinating enough, elephants in particular, to make a movie out of them. Well, with nothing to compare by it, we can take these animals and have them do things that we know are impossible for them to do. Imagine an elephant going down the interstate and then jumping onto a bridge while chasing another car at the speed of a cheetah. Could they do that? Oh, we know Hollywood's been able to do that. If you don't believe me, look up the movie Anaconda from the 90s that had Jennifer Lopez in it. That movie actually has an anaconda, an actual extent species of snake, doing things, you know, uh, being ultra fast and being, you know, capture everybody and wants to kill everybody on sight. While anacondas are very large and very powerful, they don't you, you have a basic comparison it's like, wow, there's no way you can, yeah, it moves the way it does in the movie. So you're just not very convinced of it. And that, and that used CGI. And you know what? We wouldn't be so much convinced either if it was in, in the old practical special effects either. So there's a lot of combinations involved about where, we can, where CG is better than practical. And my argument is if you explore all the tools of the trade and understand the pros and cons of both sides, you can know how to use them and make a very convincing movie. So let me see, what do I have? I'm working on sort of an outline here, so let's see. Um, let's talk about that. Um, okay, let's um, talk about that sort of. It's, it's, it's with the very classic Ray Harryhausen movie, the last one he ever did, Clash of the Titans from the very early 80s. I grew up watching this film. And there was a remake a few years ago that had CGI effects. Okay, so we have this one that has stop motion, and if you take a look in the back, there's a character of the Gorgon Medusa, who has a snake-like body, has a bow and arrow, and, and again, she shows up in the, in, the, in the remake. So, why is it that I can watch this one without a problem, despite the fact that it's, um, it's stop motion and it has sort of jerky special effects that we know it's not very convincing compared to the newer one that has CGI effects, and particularly the Medusa, um, as it did. And again, going back to the elephant thought, this one I found more convincing because in the new one, the Medusa is going all over the place in a very chaotic, lava-filled environment where, um, where it's just going so fast in ways you couldn't you know, expect it to run. And I'm not the only one who... Um, thought of this, Brendan Tennold, I'll link down to his channel, also said this about it in his tribute to Ray Harryhausen. And, you know, he hit, so him and I have similar thoughts about this. In this one, you take a look at it back again, you see kind of red, it's in a very enclosed room, very quiet room with fires around, so it's very, so it's very dark, very atmospheric. When you see the Medusa move, it's not moving very fast, she, you see her dragging herself um, with her hands and then she lifts herself upright, where the snake tail sort of pushes her up very slowly while she gets her bow and hunts down the intruders, Perseus and two other guys, throughout these catacombs. And because of the dark atmospheric area, the hero cannot see very well, but if he tries to see too closely, he can hesitate and be spotted by Medusa or get shot by her arrows. So it creates this sort of very um, atmospheric tension about it, so it made it work. So going back to the new Clash of Titans, you know, where you see Medusa going fast and doing these impossible things, I think stuff like that is what's making modern audiences, film buffs, look at this like, I'm just not convinced of this anymore. This is just, um, it's like so much, so much eye candy, not enough substance. And not just with monsters, it does by extensive environments, um, impossible done machines. You know, if you there is a way you can just saturate too much to where if you can't get immersed into it, it doesn't matter where you have a good, you know, it doesn't matter what you, all the effort you did and all the money you spent to it, it's not going to work. So Clash of Titans is a good example where the old school special effects, when done right, you don't care. You could just watch it without a problem. Now Jurassic Park is one of those combination ones where it did use both practical 
and CG, and if you look carefully, you know exactly where it is. Yeah, it's famous for the CG dinosaurs and done well at certain shots, but take a look at the part about the T-Rex attacking the, one of the um, vans on the tour. When you see it punched down on the glass, that's a practical T-Rex. They made a full model T-Rex. Think about it, a 40 foot long, full animatronic model. There were some problems with it because, you know, mechanically it's out, you know, they had water on it and it was affecting machinery and giving um, shivers and all that, but I digress. But there's pros and cons to any sort of practical special effect that if you know what they are, you can use them both very well. Now, granted, looking back on this from 93 and looking at the Velociraptors, there's a couple of scenes to where um, it's not as convincing when you see the practical ones, and that just shows, again, the cons if not, not done correctly. And let's, so, going back here, aha, uh -huh. again, here's a newer movie, came out a few years ago, The Wolfman, one of Trouble Production, but it does use both practical CGI and, you know, oh, sorry, it's CGI and practical special effects. The practical special effects is the makeup. They had, um, um, the main character, um, as he's walking around, they put the makeup on him, the touches and all that stuff, so, he, you know, he's a classic looking wolf man, but the transformation from human to wolf, um, that is um, CG. And so if done right, it can be um, very well done. It, can it be done badly with werewolf movies? Absolutely. Look up American Werewolf in Paris. Not American Werewolf in London, no, American Werewolf in Paris, the bad sequel that came out in the 90s. That's bad CGI. Um, not used correctly, but going back to American Werewolf in London, that's practical special effects that was very well done. Sure, if you um, if you look closely, you can see how they did it. Um, part where half of him is into the floor while he's, while he's sort of attached to um, the puppetry and all that, or you see that sort of fluid effect. So again, CG and practical special effects can work well if you know what the pros and cons of both sides. Now here's one with a little bit of CGI, but more practical. That's the classic. George Lucas, Ron Howard film, Willow, a very magical fantasy, and I definitely suggest you watch this one, especially if you have kids, where in this one, and again, without a lot of um, special effects or um, in CG creates actual full-blown environments. They don't just make um, just the monsters or just certain machines. They can make full-blown cities. If you watch the movie Thor, again, you can see an entire um, landscape of Asgard that's pretty much all CG. Nothing wrong with that if done well, but here they also use practical special effects where um, you have buildings made that look like stone. Um, you have um, characters and, and equipment and armor that you're convinced are real. As I said, there's a little bit of CGI because this is one of the movies that did that sort of morphing effect where you take a face and have it fluently morphed into an animal or what have you. It was breakthrough stuff at the time, now it's common, it's no longer... Um, thought of as a very impressive thing, but you shouldn't have to think of it as the thing to do. You shouldn't jump on a bandwagon like that. Think about if you're a creative person, particularly in um, movies, and you're wondering should I use CG or should I use practical special effects, think about what it is you're trying to accomplish. Then look at the pros and cons of, of any of the uh, any of the stuff where it's costumes, puppets, stop motion, or CG, and see see what will work. See, okay, stop motion may not be much use today, but maybe on the side deals. Not for the main monster, but well, let's take a look at the um, Star Wars A New Hope. And there was that one scene where C-3PO and Chewbacca are playing a little board game, and you can see the little um, characters, which were stop motion, and they were fighting each other, through all, and these were all in hologram, but practically it was done with stop motion on that. You can have certain scenes where stop motion could be done with that. So... I don't know how really to end this. It is kind of a long rant about movie special effects. But again, um, has this been done in other media? Absolutely. Take a look at video games. Now, video games back in the um, the Atari days, up into Nintendo, Super Nintendo, you had these sort of pixelated graphics, which were not that well detailed, limited technology at the time. But as new consoles came out, came out you have you know, from Nintendo to Super Nintendo, from Sega Master to Sega Genesis, we went from 8-bit to 16-bit. What this allowed is we were able to show more detail, show um, more character, show more environments, more color. We were able to flesh out things more impressively. We're at the time with both movies and video games to where the technologies 
can give us the most realistic, but if we want to, we can go old school. And with that, you know, you have this whole, in the video game industry, you have a whole series of games that goes all over the direction. We're at the point where all your tools are there. What do you want to make and how do you want to do it? There are games right now, there's this one game called Hyperlight Drifter. I'll put the link down below of the trailer. It is all, um, it's all very old school um, um, pixelated graphics. But it's done very well to where it's very engaging. You have fun. You know, you, you look at the environment. It's kind of basing itself off uh, Nausicaa and Valley of Wind, a very good um, Studio Ghibli film. I might suggest watching it. But when you hear people saying that, I don't want, you know, I'm tired of all the CG, we need to go back to practical special effects, it was so much convincing. Don't think like that. You have all these tools out and they all have um, some pros and cons to each of them. If I, and once you understand and see movies where they've done them right and understand a lot of movies that's done them wrong, you have a reference in the future to make something and create a, um, um, a movie that can be entertaining and people can get in, engaged to. And if you've really done it right, they won't be thinking about the special effects. They'll be engaged into the story and the events of the movie, which is going to be more important in the long run. You're not, it's going to be hard to try, you're not, the whole idea of the movie industry is to entertain, not necessarily by bringing out a new technology. Um, it is utilizing that technology to help us immerse ourselves in what it is you're trying to portray. So, let's see. I th uh, so that's about all I got to say about that. And let me know if you think, if you have any thoughts. Maybe you could point out some old school movies there or some new stuff to where... You could list all you know all the things you were convinced by the old special special effects. That'd be interesting to hear. Thank you very much for watching. You all have a nice day.